Welcome to this day of worship and solemnity, prayer and humility. We come together on this Ash Wednesday to begin a journey. A journey that has a shadowy end awaiting up before us. But today is the beginning. And we invite you to humbly be a part of that beginning. As we come to gather two churches as part of the body of Christ, we will take on the ashes of our repentance. And we will eat of the cup and bread. And we will know that the one we follow has already been on this journey. So will the people of God join together beginning this worship hour? Would you please rise to your feet and join me in our call to worship? God says, look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all of your workers. Is this not the fast that God chooses to loose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help. Let us pray. Lord, on this evening, we come before you. And may we bring you, Lord, ourselves to be broken before your altar. You, Lord wish to heal all of us, not part of us. No journey like this that we are to undertake can ever begin haphazardly. It must be taken with intentionality and with an openness that says, Lord, read me, be with me, and lead me. So in order for us to do that, may we pray together. Just as your son taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to raise your voices in the hymn number 143, What Wondrous Love Is This? Number 143. for curse. 
soul to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was seeking down, seeking down, seeking down, when I was seeking down, seeking down, when I was seeking down, beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing to to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I am while millions join the theme I will sing, I will sing while millions join I will sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be, and through eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on, and through eternity I'll sing on. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord, do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, 
do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets so that they will be praised by people. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your charitable give, giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they will be seen by people. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into the inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, whenever you fast, do not make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they distort their faces so that they will be noticed by people when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, you have, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by people, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasures is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. my heart Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you in me where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song. 
to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my Righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need Have any lifelong Baptists in the room? Yeah. A lot of Baptists aren't really historically known for following the traditional church year very closely, are we? In fact, when I was growing up, we usually only had three main events, right? Christmas Eve, Palm Sunday, and Easter. That's really it. The rest of the year was just fly by the seat of your pants, preach whatever you want. And historically, I think Baptists got away from some of the more traditional rituals of the church because of their theology of simplicity, of sticking to scripture alone, because some of these traditions obviously were created post-scripture. They also saw what were obvious abuse and excess in much of the Christian tradition at the time of the Reformation. But as we sometimes do, we might have tossed the baby out with the bathwater because we've removed some really helpful traditions. Following the rhythm of the traditional church year keeps, keeps us in a rhythm of our faith journey through Jesus' birth, life, wilderness wanderings, death and resurrection, and then the birth of the church and its mission in the world. And I find, for me, that this rhythm gives good purpose to our worship. It makes us mindful of the full life of Christ and the ways the church has celebrated those moments in Christ's life in important ways throughout the year. So when we come to Ash Wednesday, I'm always a little sad when some folks say, well, that's just too Catholic for Baptists to be doing. <laughs> Baptists most definitely know how to follow the church here and appreciate its rhythms. The Roman Catholic Church does not have a cornered market on the church year, and many Protestant traditions, not just a few Baptists, observe Lent and receive ashes on Ash Wednesday. And while we Baptists yet may eschew some of those traditions of the ancient church, especially in the way we govern ourselves, we are staunchly autonomous, we are free in our prayerful consideration of scripture and our relationship to God, to observe traditions that bring meaning to our worship experience and to our walk with God. So welcome to Ash Wednesday to all the Baptists who perhaps haven't done this as frequently. We're here together this evening, a group of two sets of Baptists and perhaps others who are visiting with us who recognize the holiness of this season and what it means in these moments to receive ashes as we begin a season of penitence called Lent. We read in scripture in many places that for seasons people would fast. They'd take a break 
from those things that filled their lives in order to more fully experience God's presence. When they mourned their sinfulness, like we read in Joel, they would rend their clothing and they would repent of their sins and beg for forgiveness. They would wear sackcloth and ash as a symbol of sacrifice and penitence. The use of ashes as a sign of mortality and repentance has a long history in both Jewish and Christian worship. Receiving ash onto one's body meant participating in that call to repentance and reconciliation. Ash Wednesday was the ancient church's way of starting a season of 40 days of repentance leading up through Holy Week to Easter Sunday morning. And that number, 40, it's not an accidental number. While Ash Wednesday and Lent may not be observances straight out of Scripture, they are based in biblical ideas. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days when he was tempted by the accuser. That same wilderness that Jesus was in symbolizes that wilderness in which we find ourselves, in which the Israelites found themselves. As we all struggle against sin and selfishness, and even though we might not sacrifice on altars anymore, it was never really the literal ashes that made us whole in the first place. Our psalmist in chapter 51, very familiar psalm, we'll read it in a moment, says, God has no delight in sacrifice. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And it is in that spirit that we enter this space tonight to receive ashes, as so many have for so many centuries, and to wear them as a sign of our own repentance, our turning away from the sin that binds us, that same sin that crucified our Savior on Good Friday. But if we're Christ followers, we also remember that any season comes with it the peril of our own egos. Our gospel lesson today reminds us of this. Jesus says, don't fast and pray so others can see you fasting and praying. The goal of a season of fasting and praying is not to announce to the world how holy we are, but instead should be an opportunity to draw us closer to Christ and understanding Christ's suffering. When we, do, when we do without something when we fast, whether it be abstaining from a favorite food for 40 days, watching less TV, engaging less or not at all in social media, it isn't about wearing a badge of honor for being pious. Hey, look what I for, did for Lent. <laughs> These ashes also aren't a badge of honor. Instead, when we fast and we pray and we wear ashes, we do so as a people seeking forgiveness in humility, not as people seeking attention. And if our Lenten devotion were not, in our Lenten devotion, we're not filling up those empty spaces, if we're not filling those with Christ, then we're missing out on the point of fasting anyway. If we're fasting just to fast, we haven't done it right. Lent is a time for then filling up those empty spaces, intentionally seeking the way of Jesus together. So if you skip that piece of cake in the name of Jesus in these 40 days, you better well be praying for thankfulness for the food that you eat. You better well be giving food to the hungry. If you aren't watching that extra hour of TV in the name of Jesus, what a wonderful time to prayerfully take a quiet walk or to attend a Lenten worship service or Lenten study. Spiritual disciplines are not for our piety and our ego. They are for our penitence, our asking of forgiveness, and our willingness to transform into the kind of people that Jesus calls us to be. And whether you wear your ashes to bed and wake up with a dirty pillow tonight, 
or if you wash them off the moment you walk out of church, the wearing of the ash says more to us about us than sometimes our fasting will. You'll note that Jesus didn't say, don't fast or give alms or don't pray, right? That's not what our gospel lesson is about. He just said, when you do this, when you wear your sackcloth and your ashes, it's not about you or your reputation. It is about your relationship to God. Understanding what it means to place your hopes and dreams into God's hands and not trust your own devices. And admittedly, I don't often see ashes themselves as a mark of piety. If anything, I find them a little bit messy. We're all going to leave a little dirty tonight. <laughs> it's something I don't particularly want to wear to the grocery store, though many of our Catholic friends who are TV anchors were wearing them right there on TV today. But isn't that what it's about? That messiness? We wear our imperfection and our mortality on our skin to remind us again that it's just not about us. If it were, we'd be consistently messing it up and failing at it. So, as we wear our ashes, forever how long they stay on, it ought to be reminding us to spend more time with God, asking forgiveness that we always need, living lives of prayer, that help us become transformed into Christ's likeness and not continue on our own, in our own ways, in our selfishness and our self-focus. Priest and theologian Henry Nouwen once said, there are as many ways to pray as there are moments in life. Sometimes we seek out a quiet spot and want to be alone. Sometimes we look for friends and want to be together. Sometimes we like a book. Sometimes we prefer music. Sometimes we want to sing out with hundreds. Sometimes only whisper with a few. Sometimes we want to say it with words. Sometimes only deep silence. And in all these moments, we gradually make our lives more of a prayer. And we open our hands to be led by God even into places we would rather not go. If our mark this evening isn't for the purposes of humbling ourselves to the call of God to walk through this wilderness journey together with prayer and petition, then we aren't experiencing this in the way Christ would want us to. Instead, the mark of ash should be the start of transformed hearts and lives on an intentional 40-day journey. Wearing these ashes reminds us that we cannot wipe away our humanity so easily. We have to accept it. Remember that we are dust. We are going to return to dust. And yet, we are beloved dust. Dust with a purpose. Dust that God formed into life and loves unconditionally. Dust that is imperfect and messy and sticks to everything, <laughs> and yet forgiven. That ash on your forehead reminds you that dust is what God entered and lived among, and it matters. So when we wipe our ash away eventually, maybe this evening, perhaps in a shower, we can remember that our imperfections, while they cannot be washed away by human hands, they can be washed away through God's unfailing grace. Friends, we can trust that we are going to be made clean, made whole, in these intentional steps we take on a 40-day journey together, on a season that leads us to resurrection on Easter morning. And because of this good intentional work that we do, we will see the power of God's Holy Spirit anew in our lives, in the lives of our churches, 
and in all those whose lives are touched by our love and our ministry in Christ's name. And for that, I am grateful for the messiness of ash, for the journey of Lent, and to begin it together here this evening. Amen. No service of ash and table is complete without confession. We are going to join together in a prayer of confession that is the, perhaps the greatest prayer of confession out of the scriptures by David in Psalm 51. So I invite the people of God to offer God our confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. It is a hard truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide, Hide your face, face from my sins, sins and, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will return to you. Deliver me from my affliction, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Would you pray? Lord, we know that we come before you having pleaded mercy, O oh Lord, you are faithful for us to receive mercy. Having opened ourselves that your spirit may cleanse us, you have washed us anew. So let us, Lord, revel in your salvation, your forgiveness, and not our own. In the living Christ, we have come before you now. Amen. Will you join me as we pray a prayer of thanksgiving over the ashes? 
Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now, you will be invited to come forward down the aisle in the middle to receive ashes on your forehead or your hand, or simply to receive a blessing if you do not want ashes. After you receive your ashes, you can also receive a communion cup and return to your seat, and we will share in communion together once we've all received our ashes and elements. If you are unable to come down the aisle, we will bring your ashes and communion your direction once everyone else has come forward. Friends, we are dust, and to dust we shall return. But we are beloved dust. Come.
we gather around a table of remembrance this evening as well, a table, table that recalls a final meal between Jesus and his disciples. At this meal, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after he had blessed it and given thanks for it, he said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the bread of heaven. Take and eat. As Jesus had done with the bread, he likewise blessed the cup and giving it to his disciples. He told them that this is my blood which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join as we sing hymn number 297, Search Me, O God, number 297. Self and pride, I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. O Holy Spirit, revival comes from you. And now, if you will join me in our benediction to be followed by our response of the chorus of Lord have mercy. Marked by a cross, cherished and forgiven, 
We are traveling home. Called to be holy. Called to be changed. We are traveling home. Across deserts, over mountains. We are traveling home. God in our hearts, God in our lives. We are traveling home. 